One of the biggest problems many people face, uh, particularly our young people, is the, the issue of, of sex and sexuality. So I'm going to talk about this topic not to be uh, controversial or to, uh, to be uh, topical or anything like that, but simply because I know from my experience that it, it is um, a big stumbling block for many people and I think it, it does need to be addressed. It is unfortunately still, uh, it seems among many Christians, something of a taboo subject, and it certainly should not be. And also there is, unfortunately, a tendency to respond to sins of this nature in an excessively austere manner. There is very little compassion and understanding in regard to this, this problem. And there are many um, other issues around uh, sex and sexuality uh, which are often dictated uh, by the climate of, of our secular society, and this is particularly the case when it comes to, to homosexuality. And it is very difficult often for us Christians to have a dialogue with secular society about these matters because our views are based on a theological uh, standpoint while secular society uh, is based on a humanism or on uh, certain moral views in which God does not even come into the equation. And it is often very difficult for us to explain our position on certain things. How do you explain to someone who does not believe in God that what you do with your body matters, that what how you treat yourself is anyone's business but your own. We can't really engage in an intelligent dialogue with secular views on this, this matter until there's an understanding of what, what our views are, are based on. Now, the, the first thing I want to talk about, and one of these things that many of our people, particularly our, our younger people, struggle with, is the church's position on premarital sex. This is, uh, for many people, a, a major problem. Generally speaking, uh, the church's view is that uh, sex is only for, for marriage. And that is not a position, I think, uh, can can change. But there is unfortunately a lack of compassion towards those who, who fall into this sin or who live that lifestyle, shall we say. And I think we need to consider one of the, the difficulties here. In fact, there is no mention of premarital sex anywhere in the scriptures. Um, I'm not really aware of it existing in the early patristic tradition. And there's a simple reason for this. In that, that time and place, premarital sex was practically impossible, in as much as people were usually married by the age of 12, 13. By the time it would have become an issue, people were already married. And the problem people have today is that while they are not called to celibacy, to chastity, uh, obviously people... Uh, could not marry at such an age, it would not only be uh, illegal, it would be considered immoral today. And so they are not called to, to chastity, to celibacy, to monasticism, and they are obviously going to be struggling with this natural impulse throughout their teens, their 20s, even their 30s, 40s and beyond. And of course in a sexually liberated society it is very, uh, it becomes increasingly difficult to maintain what is no longer a socially acceptable standard. It is often difficult to be in a relationship in which the one partner wishes to refrain from this and the other one doesn't. So uh, our people are faced often with, with a great difficulty here. And this is not to say that the church needs to change its position on what it considers to be right and ideal, which is that chastity before marriage is, is the, the way to go. But when the, where there is room for change, uh, if indeed there is there is a really a change going on, is how we respond to it. As I said, there's a tendency when it comes 
to sexual sins to be excessively harsh, as though it is the worst sin that could possibly be committed. While we seem to accept uh, all manner of other sins like pride and anger and gossip and slander, we shrug our shoulders and say, well, nobody's perfect. But when it comes to sins of a sexual nature, we seem to have a much more austere uh, view. And so I think we need to have more compassion and, and give people some hope that even when they fall into this sin, that they can get up and keep keep trying. I kind of mentioned that I'm not sure if this is a change in our church's position there. In fact, when it comes to the way the church responds to sin, there's always been a great deal of flexibility in the Orthodox Church. In the early church, after the persecution of Christians, there was much debate about how we should respond to those who betrayed their faith in order to save their own skin, those who changed religion or sacrificed to pagan, uh, pagan gods and so on. And at first, well, many Christians felt that they should be very severe, that they were excommunicated for life. Others said this was too harsh. And throughout the centuries, the church has actually adapted to pastoral needs in as much as if people have committed a very serious sin, which once upon a time, according to the church's rules, its canons, there was a, a very lengthy period of excommunication. Later on, the church adjusted that view and said, no, this is too harsh. And I think we need to bear this in mind when we're dealing with sins which in our day are particularly prevalent and, and difficult to deal with more than they were in the past. There is still that room for adapting to how, how severely we respond to things. And like I said, this is actually nothing new. There's some very interesting passages from our church fathers that talk about how important it is to to have this compassion, to do away with the rules which are written about the severity of, of, of penances for certain sins that have, have been committed. One great example is, is St. John the Faster. And he writes in, in his work, his uh, Canonicon, he says, in these exceedingly sympathetic judgments of economy, that is dispensation with the the rules about penances and excommunication. I know that I will be condemned by God, the common judge of all, but it is better to be thus condemned in such matters than to be praised as lacking in sympathy. A similar statement was made by a much more recent church father, St. Justin Popovich in the 20th century, and he said it very beautifully. To preserve the holy canons, I am ready to sacrifice my life but at the same time to save one person, I'm ready to sacrifice all the holy canons. Another great example of the church's flexibility in, in terms of how it uh, approaches people who have committed sins uh, is to be found in the sayings of the Desert Fathers. A brother asked Abba Bimin, saying, I have committed a great sin and I wish to repent for three years. The elder said to him, it is too long. And the brother said to him, what about one year? And he said, it is too long. Those with him said, what about 40 days? And he said again, it is too long. And he said, I tell you that if a person repents with all his heart and has no intention of repeating the sin, then even in three days, God accepts him. I'll give you another example uh, from Saint Neophodos, who said, and when I said, will I who am defiled by many sins become worthy? And he said to me, how many days did the woman fallen in many sins need to be cleansed? How many days did the prodigal require? How many the thief? How many the tax collector? Did not each of these find salvation in the twinkling of an eye? Yes, I said, but they saw the Lord with their own eyes and were granted immediate remission of their sins. And do you not believe that even now Christ accepts and purifies and sympathizes with penitence no less, even if he is not seen with our own eyes? And even though we do not see him on account of the fog of our passions, nevertheless he sees us and either shows mercy on account of our penitence or turns away on account of our sin. What these statements illustrate is that what we are concerned with above all else is the salvation of human beings, the salvation of sinners, not rules and regulations which are always there to be adapted. The rules are made to be broken. And this has also been well summed up in a, a letter uh, from Abba Nilus 
to uh, to a monk and this is actually this letter is actually often contained in manuscript collections of canon law and it concerns how priests should deal with with those who have come to them confessing uh, severe sins he says note O priest, not only the severity and wrath of God proclaimed in the divine books, but also his immeasurable and inconceivable love for mankind, as Holy Scripture says, addressing the Lord in our name, your mercy is great upon me. As we sin greatly, so when we repent, he pours out upon us the ocean of his own surpassing compassion, extinguishing the fire of our wickedness. You need, therefore, to make calculation not only with the judgment of Christ, but also with the compassion of Christ, who in our own interest chastises the human race and condescends and suffers with us so that we do not perish. This reminds me of the passage in the Gospel when a woman is caught in adultery and some people wanting to catch Christ out by making him contradict uh, the rule of Scripture. The Scriptures say... The penalty for adultery is stoning. So is it right for us to stone her? Should we observe what is written in the Old Testament or not? And Christ puts them to shame with one simple sentence. Whoever is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. And it's worth noting there, he does not say, he who has never committed adultery, but he who is without sin. This goes back to what I said before. It is unfortunate that when it comes to particular kinds of sins, many of us are actually very willing to cast the proverbial first stone because we think, yes, I am a sinner, but I don't commit that sin. I don't sin like that person. I didn't commit a sexual sin, therefore I can throw a stone at the one who committed a sexual sin because that's not the sin I committed. And this is actually completely contradictory to our spiritual tradition. Each person has his own cross to bear, his own weakness. Now, just because someone sins differently to you, that does not give you the right to to pass judgment and to cast the first stone. Another uh, passage I want to touch upon, and it is in uh, a recommendation to confessors and to spiritual fathers uh, how to respond uh, when people uh, come to confession. And he says, The person who receives confessions must take account of youth and age, of strength and weakness, of difference in place and manner in which the evil occurs, whether the penitent initiated the act or the other person, whether it occurred by premeditation or opportunity, whether it was a result of wine or satiety or not, whether on instruction and out of fear, and whether from a position of authority or of poverty, or whatever other such like matters that the confessor must investigate. He must look to the individual and the time and the place and the way of life and the degree of comfort and in this light impose penance. Similarly, he must consider the contrition and shame and the dejection and fear in the individual believer. The confessor must investigate these things and impose penance on the penitent accordingly. So this makes it very clear that we are dealing with individual people according to their weaknesses, their situation, And that also includes their particular passions and weaknesses and sins, and indeed their their sexuality. It is curious that many Christians don't seem to even consider the possibility that someone, for example, who struggles with homosexuality is not necessarily condemned just for his nature, but according to how he responds to it. What is the difference fundamentally? between a chaste homosexual and a chaste heterosexual, since both are refraining from a passion or instinct uh, which they have to deal with, I don't see a fundamental difference. It is unfortunate that some Christians seem to think a sexually immoral heterosexual is better than a homosexual who abstains uh, and and is chaste, and I think that is indeed very wrong. I said that um, someone who is perhaps homosexual and is trying to to live a chaste life does have, of course, the additional problem that marriage itself is not an option for that person. And of course, this is where uh, I think the church often comes into conflict with with secular society, uh, because 
many strands of uh, secular society say that it is an injustice to not allow uh, homosexuals to marry because at the end of the day what they are thinking is that anything which involves deprivation of a particular desire you have is somehow wrong and unjust and of course this is where the church really comes into conflict with society because the church says that is nonsense there are aspects in everyone's life in which self-denial and self-restraint are required and that applies not only to homosexuals it applies to to everybody the church does not think that our bodies are our own to do with as our please and that every pleasure and desire is good and sometimes uh, certainly in cases of, of heterosexuality and not only sexuality but other matters what may be a good thing a good desire or impulse at one time is wrong at another time um, we can apply that you know to food and fasting that food is not in itself bad but there are times when we have to refrain from it a, a soldier for example who's going to go, go into war has to control his fear or his cowardice within a sexual relationship there may be a times where one of the partners is required to actually incite his sexual desire for the sake of the partner even if that's not what he wants to do and at other times he has to refrain from that so there are times when certain impulses have to be controlled and we do not see this as an injustice we see this as part of being a christian part of being a sound human being who is not dominated by his pleasures and his instincts and his desires we are not animals we are human beings who should have the ability to to have some control and indeed that is the meaning of the the word chastity at least the greek word sophrosyne really means a harmony of soul and body where you you have some control the spirit has some control over the flesh and so here this is where we have this uh, i think a conflict between a secular view and a religious view is that we do not believe that it is wrong to to deny oneself of certain things in the name of some greater purpose or a greater cause of course it is difficult for those who do not share a traditional christian view to understand why homosexuality is wrong at all we understand that it is not in accordance with the divine revelation we find in scripture in the church's tradition and history so we we believe that if someone is so inclined and of course there are differences of opinion about whether this is actually something someone is born with or something that someone uh, chooses either way there has to be an understanding that there some things are just not acceptable and it is possible to be a christian who is so inclined who does have that problem that issue to nonetheless uh, battle with it and live a chaste uh, christian life as hard as that can be for someone who perhaps is does not feel called to to the celibate life it may seem unfair but it is the cross that they bear and this is also again going back to what we said before something we must have uh, absolute compassion about it is not right for someone who falls into that particular sin to condemn them any more harshly than you would condemn someone who is heterosexual and falls into a sexual sin because they are both dealing with their own sexuality and whether one considers the one sexual uh, action worse than the other the reality is that they are both uh, battling with their sexuality they're both carrying their own cross and we must respond i think in the same way we should not have two sets of rules for for two people but there should be a sense that uh, the same compassion and understanding is extended uh, to both we we talked about um the church's position on, on premarital sex and i think it's also worth mentioning its view on sex within marriage because the reality is that while sex within marriage is blessed there are boundaries there is a sense that there must still be some kind of restraint just as we fast from food there also has to be a sense of the ability to abstain f from from certain sexual activities at least 
not every every kind of of sexual activity within marriage is blessed. There are uh, many forms of of sexual pleasure which are, in the church's eyes, um, a distortion of true love or a perversion of of true love. And so, it's worth remembering that chastity, when we talk about that, it is not just celibacy and complete abstinence, but a sense of of control over one's impulses and working within certain limits and boundaries. This is why, in fact, even in the marriage service of the Orthodox Church, while we are praying that the couple may have uh, children, we also pray that they may live in chastity. Uh, And clearly here, chastity is not talking about no sexual uh, relations, but a sense of, of restraint and of sexual activity that is in accordance with what the church considers to be natural and and right and of course this takes us to some other difficult issues such as contraception uh, which as far as i can see there's no real official position on in the orthodox church though some orthodox may disagree some orthodox do think it is uh, unacceptable under any circumstances but Again, as we saw from earlier comments, we have to look at individual cases, uh, cases um, where pregnancy can, could could be very dangerous for the woman or, or other such cases where uh, contraception may uh, have the blessing of uh, a person's spiritual father in that particular case. What is clear is that marriage is not just about a couple loving each other and, and having a, a sexual relationship within marriage, but also it is about family. And if a couple uh, employs contraception purely for selfish reasons, purely to not have to have the burden of, of having children, then there's been obviously a misunderstanding of what the purpose of that marriage is. That's not to say that uh, a marriage without children is meaningless. If couples can't have children, that therefore the sexual relationships are, are forbidden. But there has to be a sense that marriage is a selfless life, and it's not just about having what I want. And that includes uh, sexual relationships. And indeed, any, any uh, marriage in which uh, the sexual relationship becomes uh, selfish, it becomes simply about self-gratification, um, or where it goes beyond the bounds of, of, a, of a monogamy, of, um, of a natural sexual relationship. These are all distortions of, of sex and sexuality. So is the church's position on sex and sexuality tenable in modern society? Is there room for the church to change its views on these things? I would argue that no, it is not possible for the church to alter its position on its understanding of sex and marriage and of sexuality, its views on, on, on gay marriage, its views on, on abortion, its views on, on contraception, on family and so on. But there is room for the church to condescend to uh, people's weaknesses, to show greater compassion to, to people's sins and spiritual struggles. But I would argue that here the church is not really changing at all, even if it seems to be more lenient than it generally has in the past. As I have illustrated, there are plenty of cases where the church has constantly warned us Don't forget how compassionate and merciful Christ is. That is our example. Don't forget the woman taken in adultery and what Christ said to those who were going to stone her according to the law of Moses. He who is without sin, let him throw a stone at her first. By trying to be more uh, lenient towards certain passions, trying to be more compassionate and understanding towards them, the church is not actually changing its position. It may be changing from the cultural norms and general view of Christians of the past, but within the church's spiritual tradition, its canonical tradition, there's plenty of evidence that the church has always said, look to the individual, consider his particular sins and passions, his particular weakness, and act accordingly in the name of Christ to assure all people 
of the possibility not only of their forgiveness and salvation but of their sanctification and holiness because the purpose of the church is always has been and always will be in all places and at all times to seek the salvation of all its purpose in the world is for all to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth.